Good morning. Happy 2023. And welcome to today's Economic Outlook Panel presented by Davidson College and U.S. Bank. I'm Tony Messia of the Charlotte Ledger, which is a business-oriented publication in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I have the good fortune to serve as moderator of today's panel discussion over the course of the next hour. Thank you for joining us. I will guide the discussion, but we also want to hear from you, the audience. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can in the second half of this morning's program. I should also mention that today's session is being recorded and is going to be available on YouTube and on Davidson, Davidson's uh, website uh, following the, the presentation. That's at davidson.edu. So, you know, in case you have to duck out at some point or you find today's discussion so enlightening that you'd like to share it, that option is going to be available to you. Also, a big thank you to U.S. Bank and Davidson College for sponsoring this discussion on the economy today. It's certainly timely. It's on a lot of people's minds, and we hope it helps you gain some clarity and some insights. And it should, because we have an excellent panel today. Uh, the panelists are Eric Friedman. He's the Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Bank Asset Management Group. He leads a team that works closely with institutional investment and individual clients to provide expertise on capital markets. U.S. Bank is the fifth largest U.S. bank and is headquartered in Minneapolis. The bank, as a lot of people in Charlotte know, has a significant presence here locally uh, with around 1,000 employees and a growing retail branch network. Jennifer Streaks is senior personal finance reporter for the business publication Insider. She used to be known as Business Insider. She's an author and commentator, says she and she says she enjoys making complex financial issues easy to understand, as well as providing advice for people to take control of their finances. Uh, Siobhan O'Keefe is an assistant professor of economics at Davidson College. Her academic interests include labor economics, public economics, poverty, and crime. And she says she enjoys using economic tools to understand the consequences of government policies and historic events. And then our final panelist today is Matt Phillips. He covers financial markets and economics for Axios out of the New York area. He writes Axios's markets newsletter, and he tries to explain the intersection between financial markets and the real economy that we all live in. Uh, I would also mention that a couple of years ago, that this economic outlook panel is something that's been going on for a few years. A few years ago when Davidson and US Bank held this panel, one of the panelists was Davidson's Philip Jefferson, who at the time was the college's vice president for academic affairs and dean of the faculty. Last year, he was nominated to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors by President Biden and confirmed by the US Senate. Now, I don't have any evidence that his participation in this panel and his insights led to that happening or sealed the deal, but I don't have any evidence that it didn't either. So who knows what's in store for our great panel today? Uh, no pressure, uh, but let's just jump right into it. We'd like to ask each of the panels, we'll kind of go down the line, ask them just an overarching question and get their uh, general thoughts. We'll drill down a little bit, but the big question I'd like to ask each of them is, how would you describe where the economy is at this moment and where is it going? Who'd like to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off, Tony. And let me just open by saying thank you to Davidson College. In addition to hosting this forum, Davidson makes a meaningful contribution to the financial services industry. Great students, very well-rounded. In addition, uh, professors like Siobhan added a discourse of what's happened in the world around us. So uh, a very important part of the financial community. So thanks for this opportunity to be with you today. I'd say that our viewpoint is that the economy is slowing and will likely get slower as we progress into 2023. And, and really the reason behind that is because we think the cumulative impact of interest rate increases and also just the natural cycle of consumer spending will start to slow down. And I guess to make a, an, an analogy involving a treadmill, we think the treadmill is probably at about a, a five or a six right now. It's going to get down to about a three or a four, but it'll probably get down to a three or four and stay that way for a little longer. A lot of discussion right now, Tony, about the depth of a recession if we get one. We do think we'll have a slowdown. It probably will be termed a recession ultimately. We're a little less concerned about how deep it gets as opposed to really how long it stays with us. So we think it will likely be a stagnant economy, not just in the U.S., but also um, um, internationally, specifically in Europe. And probably the area that we're in the recession first will come out first is China, although, again, Chinese data is tough to uh, track. But we do think that the order of operations will likely be a, a China, which, which emerges from a, a slowdown, 
followed by the U.S. and then ultimately Europe. But again, we're more focused on the the length of that slowdown as opposed to the severity. We just don't think it'll be that severe. So those are our our views from U.S. Bank. Jennifer, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I do. Now that we're coming out of the holidays, I think that uh, we're going to see consumer spending slow down. And I think that what I'm hearing is there is an expectation of some level of recession, but we just don't know how deep or how long it will be. And because of that, consumer spending is definitely going to start tightening. And when you see that, that's also going to slow the economy down as well. Siobhan, how about you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think the economy is sort of almost like on the edge of a knife. So I think, you know, there's almost two ways I can sort of imagine this year going. I think the more optimistic version is sort of, you know, what Eric and, and Jennifer were talking about, where there is sort of a, a, a small slowdown. Um, and that's really what the, you know, the Federal Reserve has been trying to do lately. And, and when I, you know, look at sort of the most recent jobs reports, that's what I think, you know, we see unemployment is sort of plateauing. Maybe that means we've had a small slowdown and, you know, we're going to have, you know, a light, not light recession, but, you know, maybe kind of a short lived slowdown as you know, we kind of get inflation under control going into 2023, or at least something looking more like control. You know, I think on the other hand, you know, the, the, the labor market has continued to be really kind of robust and really tighter than I think people have expected. And so, you know, the, the more pessimistic part of me might say, you know, there's there's a risk that this means that the Federal Reserve is going to have to raise interest rates above what we would what, above what, what what they have, and that'll if they kind of have to go too far in, in doing that, then that could have a, a a deeper and and sort of more traumatic recession than we would really obviously ideally like to have, and and. I'm not totally sure which one. You know, I, I am naturally a very much a glass half full person, so I want I want to think that that this this means that we've reached a, a, a nice steady plateau and we're going to see unemployment creep up, but you know, not skyrocket. Um, but I guess you know, time will tell, honestly. And then finally, Matt, you cover financial markets. What are you hearing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really remarkable economy, especially because there is this kind of dual sided nature to it. I mean, you look at unemployment; we're at about 3.7% unemployment, it's like remarkably strong job market that would indicate the economy's doing pretty well. But we have a lot of pessimism, a lot of concern about, uh, as Eric talked about, the aggregate impact of a really sharp Federal Reserve tightening regime. You know, it's, it was the fastest rise in, in the rates the Fed controls since the early 80s. And um, we've already seen the impact that's had on, on key areas like the housing market. And it's reasonable to, ex to expect um, it to continue to slow on certain parts of interest rate sensitive uh, parts of the economy. I mean, the one the way I described it is just very contingent. Like it all hangs on sort of you know the severity of any recession, whether we have a recession. It all sort of hangs on inflation, how inflation looks, and then how the Fed reacts to that picture. So that's really what I'm watching, and what really what everyone on Wall Street is watching right now. Yeah, I mean, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the panel says, okay, we could go a uh, number of, of different directions, um, and it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. And, you know, one of the tricks about, one of the tricky things about covering this economy, writing about it, understanding it, is there are so many different economic indicators, whether it's, you know, jobs numbers, consumer confidence, um, inflation. What are the factors that you're looking at? Is there one particular factor you would you would look at that we give sort of a canary in the coal mine as to where where things are going? Uh, you know what what is that? What are what are the main things you're looking at? Yeah, I'd say as as investors, the uh, almost the the mosaic that we call it, Tony. There's probably no single variable, but I'd say that that a lot of the variables we're paying attention to right now are consumer related. The consumer's been very strong and has been probably punching above their weight. And some of that is because of stimulus. Some of that is because of the amount of savings that the people had stocked up during uh, COVID and, and really trying to gauge just how much, uh, how many acorns are left, if you will, uh, is, is very important for us to think about as, as investors. We're seeing signs whether it's credit demand, whether it's credit card. Again, we're a credit card issuer, so we have information about, about you know, demand for credit card usage. Also get data from the Fed and other resources to see just how much usage is going 
on credit cards and also how delinquent, if you will, consumers are with payments. One of the things that we've been collectively spoiled with for the past, let's call it decade, is very, very cheap financing. And when you see, uh, to the point made earlier, a significant increase in interest rates and the impact that that can have, that's, that's material. And we're just starting to see that really develop right now. And so I think that, again, from a overall mosaic perspective, we're looking first and foremost at consumer data. And I think the second thing we're paying attention to is that disparity between what the market thinks and what the Federal Reserve is saying for the future path of interest rates. That is a significant disconnect right now to the tune of about a percent, percent and a half difference between what the market thinks and what the Fed thinks. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in financial market terms, that's a big deal. The market and the Fed are mostly in sync for where interest rate policy will be in for the next couple of uh, couple of months. But I do think that um, you know, as we delve deeper into uh, into the uh, the back half of this year as well as 2024, that's where the market thinks that the Fed's going to flinch and cut interest rates. The Fed is saying at this point, not so fast. So again, those would be the things we're paying close attention to, especially that disparity between what the Fed is thinking what markets are pricing in for future interest rates. Siobhan, what sort of things are, are you looking at? I mean, there's a lot of talk of recession. Typically, when you think of a recession, you think of big, you know, job losses and layoffs. And we've seen some of those, but, you know, the hiring is still pretty strong. What, what sort of things are you looking at as far as, you know, whether we're going to go on that pessimistic path or the optimistic path? Right. So I definitely look at the unemployment rate. But another thing that I look at when I'm thinking about, like, how tight is the labor market going to be, right, is, you know, I'm going to sound like a professor here. I can't help it, right? But we have to remember the unemployment rate is a fraction, right? It's both. It both includes. It's sort of the unemployment rate includes two things. It includes people who are looking for jobs, but it's also being determined by you know how many people just are in the labor force. And I think we've seen a decline in labor force participation, and that is. Right. And what I mean is that there's people who, you know, in 2019 would have been in the labor force. They would have been either working a job or they would have been looking for work. Um, but now in 2020, in 2022 and 2023, um, they, for various reasons, they've left the labor force. And so for some of those people, it's been, you know, the increase, you know, the sort of the speeding up of the boomers leaving. Um, the labor market and retiring maybe faster than they expected. Um, we've also seen, you know, women leaving the labor market, you know, related to childcare issues. And that's something that I look at as well, because we're, you know, we need to see sort of some slack in the labor market in order for kind of to deal with inflation. And, and until, but if we have sort of lower rates of participation in the labor market, it's going to be really hard to see that slack, right, without really inducing really high levels of employment, which no one wants, right? And so that's something that, um, you know, I don't think, that's not something you know the Federal Reserve can really do much about. I don't think that's actually much the federal government can do much about in the short run at all, honestly. Um, but that's something that I've been kind of looking at of thinking about if we're going to be able to do this in a kind of gentle way or not, is to see, you know, can you get some of these people back into the labor market? Jennifer, what about you? If I'm a consumer, yeah, how do I make sense of all this? You know, I, I see all these signs pointing different directions, but if I'm trying to save for a house or save for college or save for my retirement? I mean, what are some of the things I should be looking at and thinking about right now? Well, I know that in my work, we're looking at consumer spending and also pricing. And so if you're someone that's thinking about saving for any sort of big time goal, whether it's housing or whatever, you need to think about how you're spending your money. You also need to look at your debt load. You should be looking at interest rates, thinking about what the Fed is doing. And I would also say that it's really important that you are taking time to think, is this the right year to even buy a house? Is this the right time to buy a house or to engage in a big purchase? And this is what I think uh, when I think about the markets and a recession and how we're seeing consumers, or I think we will start to see consumers start to pull back in terms of their spending because they sort of want to say, well, I want to see how things are going first. I'm not all the way sure. There aren't any red flashing lights that are saying we are definitely in a recession. We're definitely headed that way. So let me just sort of hold on to sort of my acorns and see where I am. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen some of that pullback in the housing market. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're buying a house, it's a exactly. lot more expensive now than it was six months ago or, or 12 months ago. Do we expect that to you know, uh, spread to other areas of the economy? I think that that's going to last. And the thing with the housing market, when everything, when the housing market, when things get more expensive, it trickles down 
for some reason, because everything else becomes more expensive. You see the builders, it takes more to build a house. Everything at Home Depot starts to become more expensive. And you see that trickle down all through the economy. So when the housing market starts to suffer, it's sort of indicative that everything is going to start to suffer in some way at some point. And I mean, I just think that it's a harbinger for what's going to come down the road. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Jennifer, and, and Siobhan can run laps uh, around me on this, this point. But one of the things about, um, about, you know, just empirically, this whole concept of the wealth effect mm -hmm. and the impact that the housing market has on people's consumer choices. And mm -hmm. it's, it's been proven uh, across so many different cycles, across so many different regions, that if your value of your house is going down, you don't spend as much money. And it tends to be both the biggest asset, the biggest liability on most people's personal balance sheets. And so if the value of that asset or liability is unstable, particularly to the downside, that leads to just less activity. So to your point, there are a lot of downstream effects, whether it's to restaurants, whether it's to consumer apparel purchases, whether it's to durable purchases. And, and so I, I think it's also important, maybe just one consideration, just given our footprint around the country, is that you know, this recovery or, or even this, this slowdown and then the hopeful recovery post the slowdown will be very uneven by region. If you think about some of the, the let's call it geographic areas that have seen massive increases in home values, but don't necessarily have the infrastructure, whether that's job growth or the physical plant or even just, you know, frankly, the, the weather uh, to support uh, those, those trends. That, those could be areas that are, are really unduly impacted. And so, again, um, uh, places like oceanfront property, they're not really building many, many more of those uh, in, the, in the world right now. But if you look at some of the other interior parts of the U.S. that, that maybe don't have a strong a consumer base or don't have strong infrastructure or education or medical or what have you, those areas could be quite vulnerable. And again, that, that wealth effect could be very unevenly spread across the country versus being more homogenous, um, uh, which is which is how we sometimes as market participants think about things as opposed to being more diffused around the country. Scott, I'd just like to remind our audience, if you have any questions for our panel, please feel free to drop those in the chat. We'll get to those in the second half of the program. Um, Matt, you know, what about the markets? You know, 2022 was a, a tough year for the markets. The NASDAQ was down by about a third. I think the S&P 500 was down about 20%. Dow Jones Industrial, a little bit better, down, I think, 9% for the year. It's always a big question where the markets are going to go. But, you know, what sectors of the economy do you think are, are poised to do well uh, this year? And, and which ones maybe not so well? You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, we always run into this question about, you know, is, you know, I, I often harp on this point that the stock market and the economy, um, you know, are very much not the same thing. And they become increasingly divorced over the last decade or so, uh, largely, I would say, because of the impact of the Federal Reserve and really, really low interest rates, which have supercharged the stock markets uh, until it changed last year. And we saw we saw the impact of that. So, I mean, you know, just to go back to what we were talking about a second ago, one thing I would say in terms of what the markets are really watching is information on rents. Um, those have been coming in and falling, um, not super sharply, but consistently over the last few months. And that takes a while. Those are, there's like private data that, that, um, takes time to feed into the official government numbers that we would see in the CPI. So if rent, uh, if, if rents come down, that would help inflation. And I think the stock market would view that as a really, really good thing. They would probably be too optimistic and thinking, oh, hooray, you know, low interest rates are back. The Fed is going to turn around and start cutting, um, which I don't know if that's true. So that kind of gets to the second point of you know, really how the Fed reacts to, uh, you know, falling inflation. And, you know, we should point out, you know, it, inflation peaked around 9% back in June, I think, you know, we're down to seven now, you know, that's not, uh, that's not insignificant. I mean, it's still crazy compared to where we were over the last, you know, 30 odd years. But if it keeps coming down at that rate, I think, I think there's the potential for some optimism for the stock market. But again, you know, if I knew, I'd be uh, working at a hedge fund somewhere. <laughs> right. Well, 
Eric, you, you don't work for a hedge fund, but you work for U.S. Bank and you keep an eye on these things. What about the, the different sectors? Are there any that you like uh, this year and any that you don't? Yeah, I, I think that uh, our, our viewpoint is to really emphasize cash flow. And, and so what are sectors that we think will do well? Utilities would be one. We think energy, which has been a, a significant performer last year. We don't want to chase the hot dot of last year, but there's a lot of positives happening within the energy sector just with respect to better capital discipline and uh, and certainly will be volatile. But, um, uh, but, but again, we think there are some good fundamental underpinnings in, in energy. We also think that infrastructure, which is a combination of utilities, ports, and the energy market are, are worthwhile things to take a look at. These tend to be underloved, underappreciated, and underowned. And, and so in an environment where we do think that there's going to likely be some back and forth on inflation, we do think that, that companies that spit out cash flows and reliable cash flows, particularly regulated cash flows, will do quite well. So those would be things we'd emphasize. We think it's too early in technology. We're long-term believers in tech. We think that CFOs are going to spend incremental dollars on things like uh, networking equipment and, and things to make companies bigger, stronger, faster, and emphasize more focus on, on capital improvements and, and efficiencies, which will likely be manifested in technology spend. But we do think that there's probably a bit of a retrenchment going to happen in the first half and maybe even the early second half of, of this year in terms of CFO's budgets. And therefore, we think it's a little bit early uh, for technology. So again, we'd be more biased towards cash flowing. We also think that just from a, you know, a, a, you know dear old um, uh, cash flowing in, in the bond market, that short duration bonds, which again, that's just Wall Street speak for bonds that mature in, in very near years are, are very attractive. You know, this time last year, you would get about 0.15% for a, a 12 month treasury bond. Uh, right now, you can get four and a half percent. That's uh, that's 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 pretty good, uh, you know, uh, cash flow, if you will, for owning a 12 month piece of paper. So those are things that we think are worthwhile looking at. Uh, again, I think it's a little early to be overextending, even though to your point, um, uh, Tony, that, that we've had a tough slog through technology. I think it's a little bit early right now. We'd be more focused on, on cash flow and, and yield in this current environment. Jennifer, what about in households? Are there any different ways that people should be looking at, at saving or, um, or are there any uh, vehicles for, for saving money um, you know, that maybe make more sense now uh, that didn't um, you know, last year? Uh, there are like increased returns on savings accounts higher than they were last year. I think that um, really before anyone even thinks about a savings vehicle, they really have to go in and see what they can cut in terms of expenses so that they have money to save. That is a constant question that I get. How do I save money when I feel like I'm not making ends meet right now? So you have to go in and check out your budget, see where you can cut expenses, prepare for 2023 understand what your debt load is and see uh, how you're going to prepare for this winter, which is supposed to be harsher. So your utility bill might be higher and sort of take care of those things first and then decide how you're going to save or what savings vehicles you are going to use. Also in terms of saving, the best way is to automate your savings, just to set it and forget it and make saving a habit. So that way you're taking advantage of compound interest. And because you're used to saving, it just becomes habitual and set it up so that it comes right out of your income and you're not thinking about it. And it grows quicker that way. And to tag team on that, the advantage of automating your savings is do not try to beat the market, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people, because if, if you do, you're going to wait and wait and wait. You're probably not going to get it right. I know I'm not going to get it right. You know, maybe Eric will, right? But 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 most of us are not are not going to be able to beat the market. Um, but if you kind of wait for this perfect moment, then you're sort of waste. You're you're losing compound interest. You're not actually saving in, in a way that is sort of be able. And you're more likely to sort of panic buy, right? Like I definitely. I feel like I definitely, this is more anecdotal, but I've definitely seen people sort of panic buy houses because they think, oh, the Fed's going to raise interest rates. So I have to buy a house now. And now they're sort of house poor and stuck in a house that doesn't work for them, right? So so when you're thinking about these big decisions, you don't want to try to beat the market. You should just, you know, slow and steady. Um, and to some extent, rates. right, this panel doesn't necessarily matter for that. You just have to make, which I'm, I'm glad you're here and listening, but you can't, you can't beat the market. 
Correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you don't know, the general advice when you talk to financial advisors is if you don't really know what you're doing, you know, do do the things that are sort of um, have been proven to do pretty well over the long term. You know, index funds. If you're if you feel comfortable with the risk. Um, you know, don't try to do anything too exotic. I see there's some questions coming that people have on crypto, things like that. I mean, um, I don't know whether that we'll get into that maybe in, in a little bit, but it just seems like there's some, um, you know, just don't try to outsmart yourself, I think is usually what you hear from financial advisors, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I would, I would just piggyback on some of what we're talking about in terms of savings rate is, uh, savings rates and what Eric mentioned in terms of, of shorter term bonds. You know, all of this, and I know I'm kind of hammering the, the, the same note a lot, but all of this is sort of about the Fed's change. You know, when the Fed raises interest rates, um, it's kind of basically putting its thumb on the scale between savers and spenders or investors. So um, basically, the Fed is giving a signal to people right now. Now is the time to save. Now is the time to, to stick some money away in shorter term. I mean, I've noticed... You know, it's been years since I saw my bank trying to sell me CDs because they were, you know, yielding like 0 0.01 or what, whatever it was. So, um, you know, now I see my bank trying to uh, get me interested in CDs that are yielding around 4%. And I know you can do better than that online if you if you look around a little bit for, for shorter term CDs. So, again, I'm not a financial advisor, so people have to look at their own their own perspective. But it it, it the signal the Fed is sending to the the economy writ large is you know we're we're kind of putting our thumb on the scale for savers right now gotcha just would remind our audience if you have questions go ahead put them in the chat uh eric mentioned something i'd, I'd like to drill down on a little bit mention you know uh cfo budgets uh business spending you know a lot of businesses are going to be making decisions this year on whether to continue hiring or whether to invest in new capital equipment or expansions. And, you know, collectively, that's going to, I think, have a big effect on where where the economy goes. Are, are businesses going to pull back? And if I'm a small business owner, how do I make the decision whether to expand or be a little more conservative? Yeah, I'll maybe kick it off. You know, I think that um, in, in COVID times, it was, Tony, almost a little even binary for small businesses. It was, can I continue as a going concern? Can I keep my business open um, if I if I have to keep enduring these really high costs of everything from labor to fuel to, to energy and, and transportation? I, I think that what's a positive right now is that we're seeing forward-looking indicators and even coincidental indicators like shipping rates and freight ind indices that suggest that costs are coming down and, and that's certainly a positive. I, I do think, and, and Siobhan hit this earlier, and, and again, Siobhan being a labor economist knows much more about this than I do, but the, you know, just, just how entrenched current wages are in the psyche of, of corporate America, that's, I think that chapter has not been written yet. And, and so certainly towards, at least from our research, some of the, um, the, the lower end, low skilled labor uh, you're still seeing really high prices and high entry level wage offerings and also a lot of transparency in terms of people's ability to effectively arbitrage an entry level role that, that maybe they can get a couple bucks more an hour from uh, another another offer a couple of months down the road. I mean, that, that makes it very difficult for a small business owner and even a large business owner. You know, we as a, as a firm, we have 70,000 plus employees globally. And it's something that we certainly face as an institution as well. So I think, you know, bottom line is that, you know, our, our viewpoint is that there are some cost pressures that are improving. That's been true in the energy market. That's been true in shipping rates. But we do think that in terms of CFOs, they've had a very difficult job over the past 12, eight, really, you know, extended to, to pre-COVID times. Not only have they had to deal with tough uh, supply chain issues, but also a, a consumer, which is oscillated from experiences to stuff back to experiences. That's a very, very difficult thing to project out. You look at apparel companies, you look at some of the quick serve restaurants, you look at some of the, the big box retailers, they've all been trying to chase a very elusive consumer. So we do think the bias, to answer your question directly, is for, for CFOs to probably err on the side of being a little less aggressive with CapEx spending, and to probably hunker down a bit more, be more focused on profitability where they can, and again, uh, face some of the cost pressures that they must like in, in labor, particularly for entry-level type of positions. Those are our viewpoints. 
Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about inflation. It's in the title of this panel, sort of, a, a, uh, I think um, Matt, you know, mentioned it's down from its peaks of where it was still, you know, at pretty high levels, um, at least in the last, from the last 20, 30 years. You know, the Federal Reserve, I think, as we've mentioned, is, you know, raising rates to try to combat that. What do we see happening with inflation and what, what does that mean for the rest of the economy? Siobhan? I'll start on this, although I mean, others may may agree or disagree with me. I mean, I agree with Matt that I think inflation, you know, right, we, we have come down from the peak of inflation, and I don't necessarily think we're going to go back to, to 9%. I, I, think, I think inflation is going to continue sort of trending in the direction we want. I think I think ultimately it's going to happen a lot slower than people would would like, right? I, you know, I don't think we're going to get back to the, you know, this this this, this mystical two percent target. I mean, it's not mystical, but it feels mystical right now um, for a long time. Uh, I think, um, but I think, you know, I think if we could get down to, you know, five or six percent, I think that that's sort of the optimistic version of of the economy this year. And, and I think that's coming from a couple of places, right? I mean, like Matt mentioned, you know less pressure on kind of rent and housing, um, you know, in general, sort of with demand is sort of naturally slowing a little bit, you know, people have kind of gotten through some of their, you know, people had sort of this, 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 this pile of savings and this sort of pent up desire to buy things and go places. I think a little of that is slowing and that's going to help. Um, and, but I don't think it's going to go down that much. I mean, I think, I think if we see, you know, five or 6%, I think we'll be kind of, that would be great. Personally, right, but before we take audience questions, I got want to ask one uh, final question to the panel, um, and it's on the government policy. You know, we have a new Congress being sworn in this week. <laughs> I, knock on wood. I, I guess they're going to get sworn <laughs> in this week. It's still, as of Wednesday morning, uh, I think remains to be seen in, in the House. But um, is there anything in? you know, in the pipeline or that you see coming out of Washington on the fiscal side that's going to make any kind of a difference in 2023 on the economy? I Oh, sorry, Eric, do you want to go ahead on that? No, no, Matt, fire away. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, the one thing I have, a, I have a searing experience from 2011, I was working at the Wall Street Journal and I covered the debt ceiling fight. Um, and I think that that has a potential to be very disruptive again, especially if um, kind of the more firebrand aspects of the of the folks that are in control of the House. You know, we've seen over the last day or so that they're willing to have some sort of publicly messy fights about things. And so uh, that could be a real area to watch. I mean, that kind of uh, sparked a little mini, almost like a mini recession uh, in 2011 going into early 2012. So um, you know, that has a potential to be really destabilizing. So that's something I'd watch out of DC pretty closely. Yeah, yeah I think that's very well put, Matt. I, you know, I, I would agree. And I, again, this is not meant to be a political comment whatsoever. But if you look at how divided the individual parties are themselves, uh, that, that just speaks to, um, uh, I think, how high the bar is for anything fiscal to get passed. I think in order for something fiscal to actually happen, you'd have to see a really pessimistic outcome in the economy in terms of what would get a unified response from, from both chambers as well as both parties would need to be a very dire economic outcome. And again, there are lots of scenarios that we and other investors think about all the time and evaluate, but we think that if anything, there's probably going to be more of a bias towards episodic uh, short-term infusions. Let's say, for example, if there's an issue with uh, rolling over commercial paper or short-term financing issues that happen in the economy. Those would be things that would be addressed on more of a reactive basis. We don't think that there's any desire whatsoever, especially in a still inflationary environment for a very divided government to do anything fiscal-wise unless there's an emergency. So again, never say never, but we think the bar is extremely high for anything fiscal to be produced and do think the number of political footballs to be used uh, on issues like debt ceilings and, and continuations, those are variables that will very much come into play over the next couple of years. Got it. All right, let's go ahead and get to uh, some audience questions. Uh, first one is uh, sort of back on the topic of inflation. What do you see as the biggest drivers of either continued inflation, food, or where inflation may decline or even become deflationary, like housing? Who wants that one? 
I mean, maybe to kick it off, I think the, you know, one of the points made earlier, I think that Matt made a, a very important point about, about rent and, and not to get too wonkish here, but there was a paper put out over the holidays. I was told not to read things over the holidays, but, but I, I, I had to. And, um, and in fact, the Federal Reserve is looking at more contemporary data now. And, and to Matt's point, as his astute observation, there was a time period where what's called owner's equivalent rent, which is if you own a house, and you actually were to uh, have some sort of an artificial rent calculation around what you pay or what you would pay in rent, that, that tended to be very, very lagging data. Now we have a number of, of different services out there. You know, pick your favorite um, a, a private company or even public company that produces residential real estate information that produces ideas around not just housing costs, but also rent information. That's starting to be factored in. So we do think that that rent is the biggest part of, um, of of inflation right now, just by by calculation and also by by psychology. I do think, and again, I defer to Siobhan's view on this, that labor costs are are critical. And 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 again, the nature of how entrenched are labor costs, not just for lower entry level type of roles, but also for expectations from more seasoned employees and higher skill areas. So for example, if a company is going through their payroll and trying to figure out what they're gonna pay employees and they're feeling a lot of pressure uh, to keep up with the Joneses, if you will, that becomes more of an entrenched cost, if you will. And that's where inflation can be very, very sticky. So I do think that rent by definition of the data we look at is the most important, but probably the biggest swing factor will be labor costs as we think about just how entrenched those costs become in the American psyche. Got it. Okay, we got a personal finance question. Jennifer, this one might be good for you. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, for the newer generation of those who graduated from college or high school during the pandemic and into this new year, how can they best set themselves up for financial success in times where every avenue you turn is volatile? Uh, I think the best thing you can do is check how you're spending your money and make sure that you are saving money. I keep hearing from that generation that everything is so expensive. Everything is so expensive. Every time I walk out of the house, I spend $100. You've got to stop doing that because you're not gonna have money for when you need it. So the way that you set yourself up for success is if you are starting your first job, you immediately start contributing to your 401k, at least up to the match if you can do more do more then you have you set up yourself for your emergency fund you've got to have an emergency fund start trying to accumulate three months worth of expenses then expand to six hopefully get to nine and then the next thing you do is you just have a regular savings account and you automate that all of this stuff should be automated to where you have established a habit of saving you have accounts financial accounts going where you are constantly building you're taking advantage of company match employer match uh, and compound interest, and you just do it incrementally and you keep saving money. Sounds good. Uh, next question is on uh, immigration and inflation. It says the US population is not growing without immigration. Wouldn't loosening immigration rules help with the labor market and therefore with inflation? Uh, yeah, I'll take this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is and this is not necessarily a new thing, right? I mean, if, if you look at like the United States' is, like demographic patterns compared to Europe, you know, we haven't really had to worry as much about our fertility slowdown as say Northern Europe because we've had immigrants wanting to come to the United States to sort of make up for that difference uh, that um, you know, we weren't necessarily having um that many babies. Um, you know, right, because today's babies are tomorrow's labor market. Um, and of course, right, but that's you know, kind of more of a long-term issue. You know, in the short run, yes, that's really, really kind of one of the, the, the easiest and quickest ways to increase the number of people in the labor market is to take people who really want to be working in the United States and let them work in the United States. I think that would actually really be particularly true in certain industries like childcare, where like 20% of childcare workers are already um, foreign born. Um, that's often an industry we see a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of immigrants enter into. And that's an industry where, you know, we've seen huge, you know, huge cost increases. This is where these wage pressures are really, really tough on, on firms because they have really low margins to begin with. And then, you know, sort of this arbitrage effect, you know, if you can get $3 more somewhere else, well, that's what you're going to do. 
Um, and I think that would sort of help sort of the, the labor market um, pressures we've seen for domestic workers as well, right? If we had more access to things like childcare. So I, I think that's completely true. I mean, I think that's one of the only sort of short run things that the government could do to help with inflation. I think the chances of this happening politically are, are probably like zero. Um, so, but I'm not a political scientist, so maybe someone else can, you know, talk to that um, more effectively. But I mean, I agree with you. I think um, that is one of one of the only kind of, or one of the best sort of quickest tools, but I think it's unlikely to be used. If I could just add, you know, one thing to what Yvonne said, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting, you know, I think one thing that we're, that we need to think about in terms of these questions uh, about inflation, you know, for most of my career, we had a very low growth, low inflation environment, um, but it was also the tail end of this sort of era of globalization. And I think, you know, during the COVID era, we've seen a lot of stuff change, like the globalization uh, era meant like you could always expect, you know, just in time deliveries from all over the world, people, capital um, would flow across borders very easily. Um, that seems to be changing really quickly. And, and I think that's a big open question for what it means for inflation. I mean, China has basically been a deflationary force in the global economy for the better part of 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing that that might be changing, especially in the tech sector because of political uh, tensions between the U.S. and China. So I, I don't have an, any answer, but I think these really big like macro geopolitical questions are important to think about in terms of inflation, too. Yeah, I mean, the next question sort of segues into that on you know, geopolitics, international trade it says, uh, what is the impact of China eliminating their zero COVID policy on retail companies? And I guess I might want to expand that and say not just on retail companies, but that affects manufacturers, it affects a bunch of different um, industries. What do we think about China getting rid of zero COVID and the effect that's going to have? Yeah, maybe just from a investor's perspective, I'd say that China, um, as a as a consumer, is is important. And again, it's varied by by industry. But in terms of like large cap S and P five hundred, it's a very small percent of total sales. And again, it can vary greatly by company. But but just in terms of its its, its net impact, if you will. Um, it's it's not as significant as one would think. Most of the demand from China that, that most people on this call probably recall was the great infrastructure buildup where China used more concrete in the span of five years than the U.S. used in the entire 20th century, which is just mind-numbing to think about, but was a reality. And, and so I think that, that one of the, the things to consider with this the zero COVID um, a policy really changing is that some of the industries that, that are really welcoming that, that impact, of course, are travel, leisure, and services. Those are areas that are disproportionately benefited by, uh, by increased China travel. But I think what you're seeing is unease, if you will, from lots of governments about, about this policy just being literally switched off like a light switch. Uh, you know, there's, there's disparity even, you know, so this morning, you know, not to talk about morbid issues, but China officially reported five COVID deaths yesterday. Another private entity actually said it was closer to 9,000 yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, they thought if they were wrong, it was probably closer to 15 or 20. So mm -hmm. those, again, we talk about human lives. Those are not statistics, just a quote. But I think it does speak to just how challenging the global economy will be to really absorb, if you will, this new policy, which, which is still, again, happening while, while COVID cases are going up in China in particular. So net net, it, it tends from a, again, from a broad investment standpoint and not to be callous whatsoever. We care more about human lives, of course, than investing, but uh, you know, it doesn't have that, that big a significant impact in terms of revenue, but for certain industries, it is significant, but we think that the, it will be a very uneven recovery and not you know, uh, as much of a light switch on or off as, as much as China would like it to be. Matt, what about that? What about the markets? Uh, you know, China opens up a little bit more, and you know, supply chains improve, and it becomes more of a, a retail, um, you know, destination for some of our, you know, uh, international uh, companies, multinational companies. I mean, what what uh, what are the markets expecting on that, and where is that going? I think it. I think it too. I mean, we we have seen some some of the sectors where you will see kind of impacts of Chinese um, uh, travelers rising quite a bit. Uh, a lot of the sort of casino companies that have 
uh, significant operations in Macau, which is like the Vegas of of China, um, uh, ha have done pretty well. But you know, it's an open question. I mean, the, the we haven't really talked about it too much, but COVID is is still out there, and you can see even in the U.S. inflation data, especially in commodities markets, um, the, the rise of certain things, like say the lumber market. You know, like you can kind of see price rises. They go sort of like the the opening, and then there was the Delta spike, and then there was Omicron. So you can see that it's it's really still a live question. And um, you know, the the Chinese situation is really disturbing because you it's 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 a pandemic. You know, they're you know the the as powerful as the the Communist Party is over there, they can't they can't make it go away. And so. Um, it, it's. I think it's a long way till China is back to normal in the role it's played in the global economy, and if it ever is, if it's going to be just changed from now on, I think that's a really open question. All right. The next question from the audience, a little bit of a homer question here, being in Charlotte, uh, it says the national economy can be skewed. How do you all see the greater Charlotte area and your predictions on growth in Charlotte? And in the Carolinas, and maybe we sort of open it up and say, look at it and say, you know, what are the areas in the country that are growing? Obviously, the Carolinas, um, more population growth. Um, you know, there are other areas of the country, rural areas that you know aren't seeing that. There's, you know, I don't know. If we, I don't want to get into you know two economies, but what are you seeing? The questions on Charlotte areas, um, uh, economics uh, and economic growth, but I mean, more generally, what do we see as as far as how that you know sh uh, shakes out throughout the country? Yeah, I'd, I'd say just to kick it off, um, very bullish on on the Carolinas and the and then the southeast in, in general. I think that the proof behind that is the the stats that you just talked about, Tony. I mean, people will vote with their feet and. It's quite often you see, uh, you know, best places to live, areas like Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, uh, Research Triangle, uh, the, the Triad, and again, uh, down east receiving a lot of a lot of attention from uh, from from you know national and international publications. Really, what's behind that? You've got uh, a very diverse economy, medicine, technology. Healthcare, uh, not just you know, you know just hospitals, but also you know biotech as well as pharma. If you look at some of the more recent trends of electronic vehicles, EVs, uh, depending on, on one's viewpoint, that manufacturers are looking to the Southeast in particular as, as areas. And again, there've been institutions, you know, universities that have really retooled their aims to be more aligned with the future economy. And I think that's that just speaks to how, uh, how embracing, if you will, uh, local local businesses have been, and I think it really boils down to 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 governments and and willingness to go out and prospect. I mean, this you have to sell companies on coming to a state or a region. You have to do through do that through through taxes, through infrastructure. There are a lot of factors that really play into a, a company's decision to relocate. And and again, um, I think that just the underpinnings of of weather. Uh, you know, in Carolina, you're you're three hours from the beach, you're three hours from the mountains, uh, very accessible airports, and, and a great quality of living. So I, I think that you know the, some of the downsides, if you will, maybe some of the challenges the Carolinas will face will be infrastructure investment and and things like like uh, like traffic and and pollution and externalities that aren't easily erased. Those are things that are nice issues to have. There are plenty of places where I grew up in upstate New York. Uh, would would long for those challenges, um, but uh, but again, those are areas that uh, I think have have a more difficult uh, backdrop than than the Carolinas do in the in the current environment. Sounds good. The next question is on business confidence. The question is, what feedback does anyone hear from both small businesses and larger companies about their view of any slowdowns? Do you see corporate numbers actually showing this, i.e., evidence based, or is it more fear based? These things can become self-fulfilling prophecies. Who'd like to uh, address that one? Either what you're hearing from companies, anybody who talks to companies, um, or you know what the numbers are showing about uh, business optimism. I could, I I could talk a, a little bit about it. I think the, that that um, the question is is well put. I mean, 
the the economy is kind of a mass psychology process. Um, and what we've seen is basically on Wall Street, uh, analysts are marking down what they expect profits to be over the next year. Um, and as a shorthand, people describe that as profitability, but it's really forecasts. Um, you know, earnings have been strong. They 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 always seem to beat expectations. Um, and and profit profit margins have been really strong over the last couple of years as well. So I think I, I think what I'm hearing is mostly it's concern at this point. Um, but I'd love to hear what what some of the other panelists have to say. So I would say from a small business perspective, what I've been hearing, especially after the pandemic or the bulk of the pandemic where they were just decimated, it's concern in making sure that they have an awareness that they may have to be able to pivot, having more than one or two SKUs, having a, a marketing plan, and just having a way to make sure they have more money on the shelf than they did before. It's like learning the lessons of what happened. So it's concern and also awareness of uh, what could happen and being ready in case it does. Makes a lot of sense. Um, next question, uh, asking our panel to put on your CEO hats. Uh, if a CEO told you, I have $500,000 to invest, I can either buy equipment that cuts cost or technology that will grow market share, what would you choose and why? Yeah, I think um, I think the answer in this environment is is entirely dependent upon what it means for your cost of capital. What I mean by that, not to give the the wonkish finance answer, is that if the source of your funds, if the if the the financiers of of your company, whether that's public markets or private markets, would support your decision to take share, you should do it. Um, that isn't always the case. That is certainly not the case in most industries right now, where if you look at, at the push towards profitability, that's happening, especially in big technology, where for years there has been almost this blank check in low interest rates with very, very low cost of funding and cost of financing. And I, I would say that in other industries where there is a bit more of a, of a rebound and, and, and again, there's more support from a financial standpoint, that taking share should be the answer. But I think that the bias right now, especially heading into a more uncertain economy, is that most suppliers of capital are looking for profitability. And, mm -hmm. and there will be certainly opportunities to take share. And, and again, you know, counter investing. I mean, one of the, the best things that, that we do as investors or that very well-managed businesses do is they take advantage when, uh, when the opportunity permits itself. Right now is probably not the opportunity in, in a lot of sectors to, to go uh, against the grain, if you will, and, and upset your financiers. But uh, uh, we think, certainly think that there will be a time for that to be very opportunistic, especially if we get into a deeper downtown, downturn than we're, uh, we're projecting. Okay, great. We're going to go about five more minutes. We can maybe get in a couple more questions. Uh, this next one, back to the topic of inflation and real estate. If rents continue to moderate throughout 2023, which goods or services would continue to drive inflation the most after that housing data flows into uh, CPI. So I guess it's, you know, if, if, we're, if we're saying that rents are coming down, what are the, what are the other drivers of inflation if, uh, if it's not real estate? And I can take a shot at this. I think it's gonna be whatever, you know, it's, it's the big things that people spend money on, right? So I think, um, you know, food is gonna continue to be one. And that, and that really kind of comes back to you in part because a lot of that is gonna be based on sort of, you know, like, labor market issues, right? If you have to pay the people making the food more then eventually you're going to have to pay more for the food. And so I think for, especially like industries that are, have a lot of sort of, you know, lower level, lower wages or lower skilled workers, uh, we're going to see that. But although another place, I think we might also see it as sort of healthcare costs, right? I think, um, you know, the healthcare, in, you know, Industry has had a really difficult time holding on to workers. Um, it's, that goes beyond a tight labor market, I mean, right? I mean, pandemic has been tough on people. People are leaving that industry for lots of good reasons. Um, but as a result, I think we are going to see those costs continue to increase. And, and healthcare does tend to be a pretty big part of people's budgets. It's an important part of the CPI. Uh, and so that's somewhere that I, I think we would see some, some, some inflation coming from um, that I think ultimately might be kind of unavoidable. 
Mm -hmm. right? And I mentioned earlier, there was a question on crypto. I know we haven't really talked about that, but the question is the crypto market has more or less collapsed, but it seems not to have had a broad impact on the economy. Does the massive downturn in crypto present contagion risk? Yeah, we, we'd say uh, not massive contagion risk. You've, of course, had some really large players that, that have, been, have been taken down in the space. I, I do think just, just looking at the, the proportion, if you will, of ownership across institutions, across most, uh, most wealth clients of ours and, and most people globally speaking, it's just not a huge uptake. And I think the reason for that is because of just the, the underlying uh, framework, if you will, it's, it's, it's really considered a, a long duration asset, meaning there are a lot of things that have to go, go right uh, and, and, and improvements that have to be made for there to be larger institutional sponsorship and ownership. So do think that, you know, like, like there's, there's never just one cockroach, if you will, as the, as the market adage goes, that, that where there are are a couple of issues that are likely more. So we don't think that by any stretch that that, um, that story is over per se. But again, just think that that given the the prudent uptake of, of uh, crypto ecosystem investments, it's it really is not as, as large. Uh, it certainly is, is headline grabbing, but in terms of the contagion impact, there are much bigger issues that we would we would point to than, than crypto in terms of contagion risk. It's no Lehman Brothers, is what you're saying. Correct. Okay, that's good to know. Um, another question, this question's on tech. And I know, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I think uh, Eric mentioned some of this, but the question is the tech sector has consistently run at high speed for quite some time. Now we're seeing layoffs and uh, European Union fine against Meta, you know, the Facebook parent. Are the tech glory days over? And what does that mean for the economy? What about this tech economy? You know, a lot of talk, uh, a lot of growth in tech over the last few years, uh, pretty rough. 2022 where is tech going i'll take a i'll take a crack at this um you know uh yeah tech has soared uh especially like really unprofitable tech companies have soared over the last few years um and uh, you know i would argue that a lot of that has to do with the interest rate environment which is like this tail this like invisible tailwind blowing behind the the financial markets um you know, one of the good, I mean, there have been, it has been an epicenter of layoffs recently. You know, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the change in the Fed and the fact that their stock prices have cratered uh, for a lot of these companies. The good thing is that like tech doesn't really employ a lot of people. I mean, they're, they're intentionally asset light companies. They have giant, giant businesses, but relatively few employees. So while, you know, it'll be painful for areas like San Francisco, um, I don't see it having a massive impact on the the U.S. labor market, although I I would be st stand to be corrected by uh, Siobhan or anyone who's studied this more closely. No, I All right. <laughs> totally. Uh, any other thoughts on tech? OK, we'll move on. Final question. Uh, asking you to look into your crystal ball. Uh, what are the panel's predictions on the number and size of Fed rate hikes in 2023? Yeah, so really quickly, I mean, right now, uh, just for, for the audience that may be less aware, that what's called the effective Fed funds rate is 4.3%, and the market expects it to be up to 5%. We think it's going to be probably closer to five and a quarter. Um, five and a half will likely be where the Fed settles out in terms of its, its target. That's really on the back of a of a more uh, steady, if you will, inflation drumbeat. Even though we again have, I think it's a great point made, inflation has come down, but we still think it's going to be uh, a little bit stubborn. So we expect there to be probably three to four more rate hikes of twenty five basis points would be our viewpoint on the on the go ahead. Anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, that's once. exactly what I would predict. I, I think there is a risk. I, I don't know this thing is a big risk. I think there is a risk that as inflation starts to come down a little, you know, there's going to be some political pressure on the Fed to not continue to raise rates, right? I mean, um, no one likes to make things expensive or you know, make, make, no one likes to make, you know, investing expensive. No one wants to slow down the economy. Um, but hopefully, you know, the Federal Reserve will be able to, to kind of resist that and 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 stay the course. And I think ultimately that'll be the the kind of better better answer in the long run. So. We'll see. 
Yeah, I, I think that those are all super uh, reasonable assumptions. You know, I think I think one thing the Fed will want to see, and this is, I mean, this is not a scientific thing, but I think that for their own sort of political coverage, they will want to see the rates go positive in real terms, just to show that they've gotten there. So that would mean the Fed funds rate would be a little bit higher than inflation. So yeah, like you can see those two lines kind of intersecting somewhere around five over the next year. But you know, I, I'm I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, that sounds like a, a good note to end on. Uh, thank you to our panel, Matt, Siobhan, Jennifer, Eric. Mm -hmm. On behalf of U.S. Bank, Davidson College, and the Charlotte Ledger, we thank you for joining us. Have a great day.